Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Judson Davis, who is coming to us from California, the founder and director of the East West Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies, a university educator, author, counselor, and filmmaker, and of course, near and dear to my heart, a world traveler. He holds a PhD in East West Psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, where I also got my doctorate. And he is also has a master's degree from in counseling psychology with emphasis in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute, also in the Bay Area. And for those that don't recognize it, it's very, very into the archetypal studies and into Jung. And so his most recent work, which we will discuss today, Alchemy and Transformation, East West, East and West, a cross-cultural analysis of Jung psych, Jungian psychology and Tibetan Tantra is striking a very close chord to my heart. And uh, that that work is currently under review for publication. I had a chance and an auspicious synchronicity to come across Judson's work uh, as a backstory for your benefit, Judson, and to listeners. I have, of course, been uh, hard at work at my own new book, Return with the Elixir, combining the threads of Joseph Campbell, Carl, Carl Jung, and Tibetan Tantra, sometimes called Tibetan alchemy. And I was, I'm was i always very, very keen to find someone more steeped in the material than I and has, has sort of just found your work on a whim in a short and closing window before my departure for Bali and your return from Thailand. And so we're meeting as each of us are emerging from each of our respective or entering into each of our respective bardos. And I love that kind of timing. And I just feel you're a kindred spirit on paper, and I look forward to this sort of conversation because I know we'll meander across a number of different uh, subject matters and pot potentially experiences that uh, both of us have reveled in and have opened us up and uh, sort of turned us inward and outward. Uh, not the least of which is your world, uh, world, world study and world uh, your experience traveling the world to sacred sites. Uh, so I'm I'm going to just um, turn it over to you first and foremost with a quote that I often uh, throw at the outset to uh, to the up those that are up at bat, just for your little reading if you don't mind your interpretation, which is sort of emblematic of the show, the uh, Wisdom Keeper podcast. And the quote is this, Judson: Sometimes we have to go back in order to go forward. Your thoughts on that? Very interesting um, and forthright comment, and I think relevant to what I've just emerged from. I was confined in Thailand during the, the pandemic, uh, not able to leave because I wasn't fully vaccinated. And during that time, a two-year period, I really um, struggled to find deeper meaning in my life. I was not enamored with... Um, either Thai culture or many of the foreigners that I met. Um, all of that is fine and, and good in its own way, but it's, it didn't resonate deeply with me. And I found at some point that I needed to really go inward and to begin to explore again some of the areas that sometimes uh, drift um, out of our lives temporarily. And this brought me back to um, the focus on the website that I uh, put together uh, in the last year and a half, um, the content that's on the website, also um, a deep exploration of the work of Christopher Beish. Um, and we can explore that in a little more detail later if you wish, but um, in addition to Beish's work, which is in many ways a, an integration of uh, Jungian psychology and Tibetan Tantra in certain aspects of what he reveals through 20 years of remarkable LSD psychotherapy. And this is following Groff's revolutionary work, Stanislav Groff. Um, in addition to that, I began to explore near-death experience and the remarkable uh, collection of revelations that are coming forward now th through YouTube 
because people now have this vehicle through which to share these unfathomable and remarkable experiences. And in many ways, this ties into Jung's work with the collective unconscious, the archetypes, um, the archetype of the self, the, the psychic totality, and also the universal mind of Buddhism. And um, having contact with disembodied spirits, with dead relatives, with um, dimensions, that we do not normally access in our, our waking, our normal waking states. All of this helped me to uh, regenerate a sense of, of meaning and direction in my life at a time that was otherwise um, for a while quite stagnant and, and rather uh, unsatisfying. So to answer your question uh, in short form, there was a blessing in that contraction because it forced me to expand in my own uh, inner world and in the inner worlds of the people whose experiences I have been deeply touched by. And that is what I would respond to relative to your first question. Yeah, wonderful. And, I, you know, just I, I feel like the the pandemic as an archetype in itself, I think many of us, particularly people listening to the show, would have similarly felt the contraction and the space sort of serving as a you know equal parts potential cavern or or prison and and retreat center so i think you know, we're, we're 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 remarkably blessed to have at some point come across great lineages and great study matter great resources to actually make sense and make use of this kind of you know dark night of the soul. And so it's, you know, but it makes it no less easy. I mean, being resourced and well-intended and having available or access to a lineage so that you can go inward. I mean, since we're on the topic and you raised it, you know, do you want to give us a little flavor of the challenge of being there and in your mind and confined and in a way, I mean, that's my interpretation, a little bit abandoned by your country. So you sort of Un, 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 unable to return for two years, like you can't go home. I'm, I'm reading a lot of metaphor in there. And I just wonder, you know, subjectively what that was like for you. Well, you've outlined it quite well. Essentially, I felt uh, confined and with few options. And there were periods of lockdown, periods in which, for example, we had to be in by 9 p.m. Um, any social interaction was greatly curtailed. Um, I had met some people and I had, you know, a, a social a circle of social friends, but um, people go to Thailand for different reasons. And there's an old saying, it's a great place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Um, <laughs> it, 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 there. There are some lovely people and a rich cultural tradition in its own right. But where I was living, there was very little in the way of temples. It was quite where were you? overrun with motorbikes, very little nature, um, even though I was in a beach town. Um, it just wasn't um, inspiring or invigorating. I feel deeply connected to trees and to nature. And this was largely lacking, number one. Number two, there weren't too many people, actually any people that I met there, foreign or, or local, who could engage in the kind of conversation we're having today. And so in many ways, I felt alienated from two of the things that are most important to me. Mm -hmm. And that combined with being restricted and unable to leave until I finally, this earlier this year, received full vaccination status felt like I was in a sense imprisoned. So that's what then led me into this exploration of what I described earlier. So there was a uh, very much a silver lining to the experience, but getting through that dark night that you referenced earlier and having um, a kind of awakening of sorts to the material that I described earlier, um, was really what saved me because I was deeply unhappy for the first six or eight months that I was there. 
And I was waiting, of course, and waiting and, and hoping that things would change. And they that, that must that must have really been very hard because, I mean, you know, knowing that you're going to be confined for a year and then is something quite different than waking up every day wondering, is this going to be the day that something's going to change and have that stretch on for two years? That's absolutely that's correct. all that's almost a definition of torture. <laughs> well, it is a kind of torture. I mean, um, they often say that it's easier to know a, an unhappy or, or unpleasant truth than to live in uncertainty. And that too is, is you know, something that I think is, is deeply valuable because our lives are uncertain and to become more comfortable with that is important. But this was um, uncertainty in the sense of entrapment, how long I would be confined and also a great limitation of my professional options in many ways. Um, and again, because the rollout was so slow and, and Thailand and other uh, third world countries uh, don't have the resources that we have in the West, um, they were initially providing Chinese vaccines that weren't recognized by Western Europe or, or America. And then later finally began to develop AstraZeneca, but that was, you know, well into the second year. Mm. And so um, there was some light at the end of the tunnel when we began to get vaccinated in September of last year. But again, I had to get the second AstraZeneca following the initial Sinovac vaccine to finally be eligible to enter either Europe or my own country, the United States. And that's quite a strange experience to want to go home and for your government to say no we're not allowing even our own citizens back until they are you know meeting this requirement was yeah. a, a strange experience also well strange is being too kind i wonder you know i i, I put myself in your position i would definitely feel betrayed because it's not like uh, it was out, out of choice or you did anything wrong to be so egregiously treated you don't expect that from the united states so i mean listen i want to ask you you know we'll, we'll have to we'll all have you know the quote was to go back in order to go forward so we i'd like to go back into your own biography uh but before i do just to close the loop on this particular part of it uh, did you did you eventually turn a corner and start writing or make use of it as a research period and i mean did you craft did you come out with an elixir, in other words? Did you come out with something? Well, in a sense, that's what saved me, is that I, as I mentioned earlier, I began to explore the experience, uh, these remarkable experiences with so many universal characteristics of people who had had near-death experience, and also people who had journeyed into these other dimensions through various means, including Christopher Beige and, of course, uh, Groff's uh, pioneering work. And this returned me to um, things that have never left me, but I think um, were harder to focus on when I was otherwise unhappy. And um, it was finally through that discontent that I decided in order to, to survive in this period of forced confinement, I've got to go within and begin to explore and to to expand upon my deeper interests. So um, I was able to greatly expand my my website during that time, add a lot of material. I did some writing um, and a, quite a bit of additional research. And so it, it was beneficial in that sense. In a way, it kicked me in the butt and got me moving. And sometimes adversity has that effect. Um, it took a while, but I got there and uh, looking back at it now, I think probably, again, it was a kind of dark night of the soul um, from which I eventually emerged through a conscious choice to do something more deeply penetrating, more deeply meaningful. And much of that now is reflected in, in uh, my present work and, and in my website. So, yeah, so this is good. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll use your personal experience as a architecture to, to reflect on Jung and, and some of the themes because it's, it's so relevant and it's so accessible. Um, 
But one of the things is, I mean, you're talking about the Dark Knight, so maybe we can use that as a jumping off point. Can you give us a little bit of your bio and, and your maybe maybe a few beads in the mala of your childhood or your upbringing that maybe would be relevant in the in, in serving as a backstory to get you to the place where we, we are right now, which is dredging up the Dark Knight. I can only imagine in the months in lockdown that certain things were coming up and maybe those things you could talk a little bit about. Maybe there were childhood things. Maybe there were young man's angst that was in their uh, places of of conflict that you had brushed away or put under the carpet. And, and maybe you can give us a little sense of who you are so that we can, you know, that that in a way will be embodying the quote going back in order to go forward. I think that's a great question. And, and I can tell you that um, Jung's notion of the shadow, for example, which are, which are the disowned uh, negative aspects of ourselves that we project upon other people um, and that we have to eventually own in our own right in order to um, individuate or to grow and develop as a human being psychologically and spiritually. This was coming up. I was, I was having shadow projections. I found myself getting angry um, at certain people um, for things that I later traced back to myself. Not that that person necessarily had done something that wasn't, you know, I mean, maybe it was a ripoff situation by a local, or maybe it was some unsavory behavior <laughs> by a, a fellow uh, traveler. But I came to understand that that, that is in me also that I am human and that um, the image that we hold of ourselves, which Jung would describe as the persona, is very often a mask that covers um, these deep layers of uh, repressed um, personality traits and experiences. And during this time of confinement, much of this was coming up. And I found myself um, having to really um, analyze and, and be honest about my reactions to things. And of course, um, in Buddhism, it's all about, you know, accepting the moment, whatever it may present, and being able to be at peace with that, um, absent this kind of reactionary psychic response. But certainly that was taking place on occasion. And that was good for me. Um, again, um, in both Jungian psychology and in Tibetan Buddhism, it's these uh, shadow aspects or repressed um, personality traits or even complexes that eventually we must face in order to move forward. And that's part of what occurred as a result of being in that contracted uh, environment or state. And that has been very healthy. It has awakened me to the importance of continuing the work. It's not enough to just read about it, research um, these different theories, even engage in it in, in psychotherapy for a while, whatever the case may be. It's an ongoing process that never ends. It's a lifelong process of personal growth and development. And I think we sometimes get very busy in our personal lives or even in difficult circumstances and we lose sight of that. And so that was an important element for me. Again, recognizing certain shadow aspects emerging through different experiences and understanding that as, uh, a, as representations of my persona that I needed to remove the mask from and, and be honest with myself about. Um, so that was, an important part of the process. Judson, can you give us a little taste of, of how you got into Tibetan Buddhism and Jung? And they may be, it might have happened at the same time, it might have not, but how did you get to Jung and how did you get to Tibetan Buddhism? What Give us a little taste of the journey that led up to those milestones. It has been a very interesting uh, trajectory. Um, I was first introduced to Jung by my stepfather who uh, was Japanese, a well-known artist. He had lived, he had been born in Japan and, and immigrated to the States. Long story for another time, but he was very into Jung's work and a number of other um, 
psychological and spiritual traditions, including Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And he mm. presented me with a hard copy of Jung's final work, Man and His Symbols, um, when I was a teenager. And at the time, I don't think I was mature enough to really grasp the, the depth of what the book contains, but I was fascinated by the symbols and the visuals. I knew there was something there. And I'm going to put that to the side for a moment and fast forward to um, the age of 30 when I did a round the world um, walkabout or pilgrimage for six months, starting in California and then going east and eventually passing through um, Nepal, India, Europe and back to the States. Um, I had a tremendous experience in Nepal uh, during a three week trek. And I have covered... I have to interrupt. I have to, I'm so sorry. I love pilgrimage, so I'm just gonna just ask you to go back a couple paces there. What's the impetus to go on a one year walkabout? Because I think these moments are what you know Joseph Campbell might call the call to adventure and the departure. Can you give us a you're you're in your thirties, maybe something's going on twenty eight, twenty nine. I mean, it's not every day that someone says, I'm going to go walk about the entire planet and, and particularly hit places like Nepal. So before you indulge me in, 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 in my own memories of first going to those parts and those regions, what sets you off? A great uh, urgency to experience um, something deeper than what I had found in my native California, as beautiful as Southern California is, and I grew up in a very nice beach town, and it was lovely and fun and, and wonderful, but I always felt a, that something deeper was missing, that there was a, a focus on the outward aspects of life, on living well, living high, on the sun culture, uh, being beautiful, being... Um, impressive in an outward sense and uh, very much the sort of Hollywood mentality and through the exposure to um, art and aesthetics that my stepfather and my mother had brought to um, my siblings and myself I felt that going to ancient cultures would be an opportunity to explore um, traditions that had a long history and had developed in ways that I was not encountering or, or sensing in, in my native California. So that was the impetus. I really wanted to go to these ancient lands and see what there was there um, in the way of, of uh, spiritual traditions and um, architecture, aesthetics, art, all of these things that at their foundation are an expression of something deeper. So. I began with um, a trip to New Zealand for a, a friend's wedding. That was the original um, reason for going overseas. And then this other part of me came into play and the trip just ended up being a, a six month around the world um, adventure. So anyway, where things really got interesting after New Zealand, I went to uh, Malaysia and Thailand and then I flew to Kathmandu, Nepal, and that's where things got very, very interesting. At that time, this is about, this is many, what, two, three decades, this is actually 30 years ago, three decades ago. Um, Kathmandu was a very different place. It was authentic in a way that has disappeared, and it was much less crowded, especially with cars and, and all of the urban uh, confusion that is there now. Um, the ancient temples, the, the Indian sadhus who were on the streets of Kathmandu in the old town and were there themselves on pilgrimage. Temples like Swayambhunath, um, which is a Tibetan Buddhist uh, pilgrimage site and where many Tibetan Buddhists live having fled Tibet. Um, this was all incredibly magical, but what occurred on the trek that followed was another dark night of the soul when I had a kind of um, experience with another of my fellow trekkers that caused me to really question uh, who I was as a human being. And what, it, what I think occurred there was that again, the mask was stripped away 
And in the process of this three week trek, which took us through the Solo Kumbu region where the Sherpa people live, and this is the Everest Base Camp region, contact with these beautiful, uh, simple, humble, but unbelievably welcoming and generous people and visiting these ancient uh, temples that are in some cases a week's walk from the closest road head town. So you drive up to a certain point and the road goes no further and then you start trekking and you're out in the Himalayan foothills, you know, a week away from, from getting back. And the only way to get back is, is by walking or emergency helicopter. But the point being that um, in the presence of this ancient culture and in the presence of the immensity of the Himalayas, you become very small, especially if the mask has been pulled away. And in becoming small, you open to all that is. You merge or you can merge with this greater totality. But you must die first to the old self in order to be reborn in this immensity of which you are just a tiny part. You're the drop in the ocean, but you are the ocean at the same time you exist as a separate drop. And this occurred, this um, happened to me in, in an experiential sense. And it was probably the most powerful experience of my life at that time. Um, deeply humbling and, and deeply inspirational um, in touching something so much deeper and so much more expansive than one's usual contracted sense of self. Again, Jung's persona. And this again happened in correlation in part with exposure to the Tibetan Buddhist culture that the Sherpas uh, have inherited from the Tibetans that brought over the mountains centuries and centuries ago in all of these migrations. Um, and it's a, a, a remarkable place. And I highly recommend um, this region and this kind of experience for anyone who is looking to leave behind the modern world with all of its trappings and really get back to a kind of primal connection uh, with the earth and with some of the deeper spiritual traditions that we have on this planet. Mm. Yeah, do continue. You're, you're, you've got our attention, so we're in the journey with you. We're right there. You, 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 hit, a, you hit a huge marker there. So if I can just recap, you've got this uh, family member. Was it an uncle who gave you the book on Jung? That was my stepfather. Oh, stepfather, I'm sorry. And, and, and some 15 years later, you find yourself on a world track or a walkabout and uh, merging, you know, like having a conscious or mind-altering experience in the in the grace of the Himalayas. Were there other significant events on? The, I mean, I, I, you know, people who listen to my podcast know that pilgrimage is right there, up there, as one of my most beloved, you know, uh, ways to spend time in a precious human life. I think there's nothing quite like being on pilgrimage, and I, I, I I've got to just say I resonate completely with you as being a young person. My first encounter on pilgrimage was twenty years old in uh, in Bodh Gaya on the Buddhist Studies Abroad program, Antioch Buddhist Studies Abroad, and would have been 1996 now, long time ago, but it made such an impression that I think it shaped the entire course and trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't, you know, so I, I probably have made nine pilgrimages to Bodh Gaya since, including some of the some of my own tours, bringing people there, because I do, I do agree with you. I think there's something, I mean, I think it's no coincidence at the tipping point that we find ourselves in modernity that more and more people are looking for some deeper sense that you were looking for as the main impetus on your hero's call. They're, you know, they're striking the wonderful allures of California have not satisfied the urges of the spirit. I think more and more as we progress in our industrial age, I mean, more and more people are having that experience and even the export of industrialization across the planet, even even third world country where the, the lie 
is being sold and people have blue jeans and Marlboro cigarettes and, and uh, Ray-Bans sunglasses. They themselves now think that the two bedroom house is going to bring some satisfaction. The new car, the new Honda car is going to bring some deeper satisfaction. And we've just ex exported our illness to all those areas, every nook and cranny on the earth now in this age of industrialization and our secular modernist culture paradigm, I think has innately been corrosive worldwide now. So, you know, but there is still these outposts and bastions of the old world. And just like I started at the top of the, of the conversation with this quote, sometimes it's dire, important, necessary for us to go back in order to go forward. I think this is an archetype. I mean, I think this is what Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey talks about. I think this is what Jung talked about, but although be it in an internal way, when you go inward, you are reclaiming parts of your psyche. There may be childhood trauma there. There may be, you know, things brushed under the corner into the nooks of crannies of your life that you only come into contact with under force majeure, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and I think in Tibetan Buddhism, it's also there as an archetype too, at least it is in the subtle body work of, of the alchem alchemical process of mandala or deity work where you have to leave your ordinary sense perception of who you claim to be in a reified way, who you think you are, in order to occupy the center most region of the mandala, there has to be a dissolution first. You have to come undone. Um, and I think, so I think the world is coming undone in, in the pandemic, the great pandemic of 2020 and its ensuing uh, tsunami waves whether they be the the new wave of the uh, Ukraine war, but all, certainly the economic crisis and the recession that's was about to hit us. This is the tipping point of the industrial age, I think. And more and more people are hungry for something deeper, though not everybody exactly knows what they're looking for. And that is, again, part of the trip. I mean, you started out thinking that you're going to hit a friend's wedding in, in New Zealand. And little did you know what you would find as you as some deeper part of your psyche was guiding you. I do believe in that. I do believe it was sort of predestined for you to, I mean, just your, I mean, I, I think of myself doing prostrations under the Bodhi tree at 20, and I can't find another explanation other than a past life connection with that place that would have brought me to that. I mean, I could have ended up anywhere. I could have been studying economics in London. I could have been in Florence studying architecture. I could have been anywhere else, but I was in Bodh Gaya. And you were in the Himalayas, and there's some very deep thing that you find there. And I think more and more people are looking for that because I think they're feeling suffocated and I think they're feeling like their soul is calling out in very symptomatic ways. Any comment on that, uh, on that sort of description of our situation, our current situation? I think it's very relevant to uh, what's happening in the world. This is, as Jung would say, a collective process. We are not disconnected by any means from our fellow human beings. Not only does the psyche go back, you know, uh, to an infinity, a, a time we can't even conceive of in its primal form through hundreds of thousands of centuries. Uh, we inherit aspects of that in, in each of us in our uh, birth into this world, but we also live collectively as a species and with the planet itself. And it may well be that we are on the fringe of a dark night, a collective dark night, this is what Christopher Bache talks about in his um, very profound work. Um, you know, it's not a name I'm familiar with, so please feel free at any time to introduce his work because it seems very, very significant to you. Uh, in the year, um, I think it came out in 1990, 1991, um, or it may actually have been, I'm sorry, it was the year 2000, uh, Dark Night, Early Dawn. So he's making reference immediately to the aspect of the dark night, which is this sense of spiritual degradation and, and utter um, inner tragedy, really. It is something that, that a person carries within, a, a sense of meaninglessness, a sense of, of desperation to live a more fulfilling life. Um, and that early dawn is the awakening that follows the dark night. And in Jungian psychology, you have this process repeating itself again and again that very often first a person must go through 
this dark night in order to then emerge um, in a, a state of, of greatly expanded uh, awareness accompanied by a sense of, of deeper meaning and, and joy and, and um, inner satisfaction. So Beish is, and this is supported now by a number of people, Groff, Gene Houston, um, Annalise Smitsman um, are doing a course on what's called the future human. Um, I've been a part of that. And this is one of a number of um, avenues through which people are beginning to explore the definitive possibility that we as a species and as a planet are going through a collective dark night. Mm -hmm. And what is potentially on the other side is a transformation, a radical transformation of human consciousness. So that the these heightened states that we often not well not often but we on if we are lucky um and i've touched a little bit upon this in in what we discussed earlier if we're lucky enough to have that kind of experience and i think many many people do at least once or twice in their lives um certainly people who are involved in deeper spiritual practice this is a, probably a more common kind of experience emerging with an expanded um, oneness or consciousness. But in any case, the people I mentioned are developing theories and techniques for dealing with the present conflict and are looking into the future in relation to a, a, uh, a greatly evolved humanity and what that might look like and how we might get there, especially in the midst of this tremendous ecological crisis combined with uh, war and famine and all kinds of, of disruptive um, happenings, which again, um, seem to suggest a, a forthcoming dark night if we're not already in it. Hmm. Um, so that is how it, I would just briefly touch upon your question. Um, it's something that we go together, that we, we go through together and is very much a collective thing. Anything that I experience on some level is available to all human beings. And so in a sense, we're all intimately interconnected um, in ways that we're not normally aware of. And we're certainly playing out these scenarios, these archetypal scenarios, the hero's journey or whatever it may be um, in the course of our lives. And it happens both individually and collectively. So um, I'm not sure if I've touched all of the points of your, your last question, but I do feel we are at a tipping point and that both Jung's work and um, the base, the essential principles of Buddhism have a lot to teach us and and a lot uh, in the way of uh, providing guidelines as we navigate our way through what will no doubt be a very very difficult time uh, mm -hmm. in the future i think probably years from now when we are no longer on the planet we're going to be as a species experiencing and going through things that we can't even imagine right now and it may be extremes of both tragedy and decimation and also of tremendously expanded human capabilities mm. um, following again this this collective dark night so this is what beige talks about mm. um, he following groff's pioneering work in um, lsd psychotherapy engaged in a 20-year process and ventured into uh, other dimensions, the kind of dimensions that um, are talked about in Tibetan Buddhism or touched upon mm -hmm. in Jungian psychology in the way of archetypal realms, mm -hmm. um, and had contact with um, what we might simply call superior entities that guided him into different expanded aspects of his own spiritual potential far beyond human incarnation far beyond human identity he was taking into um divine dimensions that in essence 
are unfathomable and, unless you experience them directly. And even Beish will, will tell you that he had to go back sometimes two or three times in order to really begin to acclimate uh, his understanding and his perception so that he could make some sense of where he was and what this represented. Now, this included the clear light of Dharmakaya, this all-encompassing um, origin um, from which all things are understood in Buddhism to originate and to return to our essential nature uh, mm. uh, the this selfless uh, totality. Um, but also many other places. And he encountered in other dimensions, other entities. He experienced his past lives. He experienced the lives of uh, human beings in different genders and different races under innumerable circumstances. It seems that he was given a crash course in both human incarnation and its multitude of forms from abject poverty to great wealth um, to the different complexities of, of gender, but also taken to these places that again, greatly um, expand beyond the human experience. Mm -hmm. So and what it tells us, what the message is, is that we are not only human, and this is not the only dimension that exists. We actually are divine in our nature. We are multidimensional. We are shapeshifters. We are in many places simultaneously. And we are in contact, even when we are unaware of it, with entities that are guiding us or with processes most certainly that are moving through us and this is much of what he talks about and so he is essentially a kind of modern day um guide Sorry. to yeah to what appears to be unfolding his work is greatly respected by groff richard Turnus, other prominent members of the transpersonal psychology community um, and he came out with a recent book, Diamonds from Heaven, hmm. which expands upon this 20 year history that ended in, I, I believe, the year 2000. And, and then 20 years later, he is continuing to amplify and to make sense of this profound, profound hero's journey. So, um, yeah, I have yeah. I have a few comments there. I mean, first of all, you're you're I'm just watching your hand motions as you describe where we are in time. Just we're I mean, the the word that comes to mind is revolution. We call it the dark night of the soul, but I also I mean, I also you know, in constructing my new book, I'm the the 20,000 foot views begins with astrology because I think astrology has a lot to bear in terms of understanding that there are cycles of time, that this is not just, the, there's not only one dark night of the soul. I mean, if I talk to you and you talk to me and we have enough, you know, we we, we have enough time together, uh, we're going to see that we've cycled through these dark nights many times. But yes. then if you take this long view and you talk about the collective, the collective has also gone through cycles of expansion and contraction. The collective, I mean, what the ancient Greeks called the Great Year, a 26,000 year period, which is, you know, delineated by the procession of the equinoxes, like the, the, the hours of a clock, you know, each, each increment is some 20, 2100 years. And each of these represents a decline and, an, and a transition. And therein lies a whole shadow confrontation. You know, the Piscean age that is, and Jung talks about this, at least in several places, but definitely in his book, Ion. Mm -hmm. The end of the Piscean Age is the dawning of the Age of Materialism. Now you have 2100 years or 21 centuries dominated by the Axial Age Revolution and the teachings of Buddha and Christ, etc. That brings a lot of incredible opportunity for the expansion of human consciousness. But by the tail end of the Piscean Age, you have, in, sh in a short order, 300-year period, the, the, the downfall of, of, of civilization. Even though you have the Age of Reason and the uh, scientific revolution and all the great benefits it's given us, it also is the paradigm of materialism and reductionism, I think, has added the core of our spiritual beingness. 
our disconnection from source in whatever way you want to translate it. And then, of course, we're now amidst some think that we're in transition in the in the transition. Some think we've already transitioned into the equation of Aquarius. And I've had several guests on the podcast very be very clear that this isn't some Hollywood or Broadway production version of the Age of Aquarius. In a way, the Age of Aquarius is the spirit of uh, the individual and individual rights, whatever that might be, the rise of people's populations against authority. So it may be the end of the guru, but it, it is in another way, the the way the, the opening to the inner guru of every single being. And that's why you see women's movements and gay rights and, and all, we, all the down the road. And eventually I had my last podcast guest uh, was talking about the, the rights of the planet, the rights of trees and plants, and also the the rights of uh, extraterrestrial beings that we are uh, constantly engaged with. So that uh, that represents another opening. And then it will also have with it, these these things are concomitant. With it comes a shadow, a right. particular, sh you know, it has its own signature. The Piscean Age upside and the Piscean Age shadow were unique to itself. And the collective, the collective species, our collective species had to both had the opportunity to embrace the upside, but also whether we decided to collectively face the shadow or not was entirely a choice that we made or not. And it gets pushed on into another series of cycles. So here we are on the cusp of another revolution collectively brought on, I think, very clearly by the pandemic, but who knows where you want to put the delineate, delineate marker or, or gateway. Nevertheless, I think there's, you know, I think there is a collective movement. You're talking about the transpersonal psychologists, but I think, listen, the, the, the shamans and the psycho psychedelic movement are also cross-pollinating with this. Yes. Because if you look and talk to wisdom keepers of, of the North American First Nations, they have a prophecy called the Seven Fires, which is, you know, their version of a story or a narrative that that is about our time, this period of great decline and great awakening coming together. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, we started at the top of our conversation with you in Thailand having both a confinement and an awakening. And now we're zooming out and talking about our collective species going through great strife and also with the great potential for some expansion into new dimensions. And when you talk about new dimensions, I don't see you hesitate. I personally don't hesitate. I think about Jung and his brush with psychosis, but I also think about the Tibetan culture that, and also the Balinese Hindu culture that live amidst multi-dimension, a world of spirits. Mm -hmm. And whether you look at it simply as an archetypal journey inwards in which you fragment and meet archetypal angels or deities, I think Jung met Philemon and had an encounter with, as his psyche was fragmenting, he also had a spirit guide. Yes. And in the Tibetan culture, it, it's conceived of differently, but in a way we're talking about the same thing. Yes, I believe we are. So please, I mean, I mean, now we're into the heart of really why I invited you here. And maybe, maybe I can just, before I get so enthusiastic, okay, we're, we, we are both sharing a kind of narrative of our time and place. We're, we're, we're sense-making that where there's challenge, there's also opportunity, mm -hmm. both on an individual level, but also on a collective level. I think this should be a reassuring message for people because I think we can get very caught up in the degradation and the fragmentation and in the downfall and in, 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 the, in the demise. But it's also sort of necessary. Yes. You and I both see clients and they come because they want integration, but you can't get to integration without disintegration. Actually, we have to welcome and create a safe container and some understanding, some nuanced understanding about the fragmentation first, the symptoms of you know, addiction, the symptoms of trauma, the symptoms of depression, the symptoms of anxiety are the souls beckoning us into a kind of awakening. Mm -hmm. And and the symptoms around us on a global level, whether it be the ecological, economic, political, structural earthquaking, 
is also a kind of beckoning into a, a revolution of in our thinking. And so I have not, in a way, come into contact with Bayesian and his work. I certainly know Tarnas and, 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 and Groff. Um, but I think it's, it's very synergistic what we're talking about. I think we're in agreement with the larger narrative. If I may just p sort of keep that sort of picture right there and, and just give you some targeted uh, questions to, to query you. Mm -hmm. um, I have been very interested in Jung and his contact with the East. I think there are a lot of scholars on Jung, but not all of them are capable about talking about Jung's, his own pilgrimage to, to come into contact with the East, whether it be Buddhism or the Tao Te Ching or the, um, uh, the, the, the book by Wilhelm, what was it, uh, Secret of the uh, Golden Flower? That's correct. So we're talking about East Asian alchemy. I know he was interested in um, Gnosticism, but in a way he became, he grew dissatisfied with Gnosticism and what he found in, in Chinese alchemy and in Tibetan Buddhism, I think fully satisfied his curie. Can you bring us into that milieu, bring us into Jung, into that period of his life and his career, what he was looking for as an individual, what he discovered with the East. I'm, I think this is a very rich curiosity of mine, and I'm sure a number of people listening will really, really enjoy that. First of all, going back to Jung's formative years, his father was a country pastor, and Jung witnessed in him this tremendous absence of genuine faith, and it was cr a crushing blow to his father. And there's a quote from Jung, um, it's often repeated, that, that children must live out the unlived lives of their parents. And in many ways, Jung did exactly that. He found meaning of the deepest kind in his life, perhaps in part in response to what he witnessed in his father. His faith was not an outward faith in an outward uh, symbol. And this is part of why he was attracted to the East. I um, mean, Christianity, we have a separate entity to which we uh, give our unyielding faith. Um, the, the religion itself does not teach us that Christ is within in the sense of um, our being Christ-like or, or our possessing Christ consciousness the exoteric aspect of the religion, yeah. the traditional yes. aspect that we're taught is that Christ is essentially a separate entity and that we are to follow almost in blind faith, um, the teachings that are expressed through the Bible and other, other uh, resources. What, and, and Jung encountered this firsthand through his father and through his own religious upbringing. At the same time, he remained a Christian his entire life. He felt that culturally he was European and grounded in a kind of, of Christian foundation. But what he sought to do was to find that God within. And that's what you have in the East. In the East, the emphasis is on your inner divinity, that each of us is part of, in Hinduism, the Godhead, or in Buddhism, this... Um, clear light of Dharmakaya, this, this expansive totality, um, this, this but a nature. Yeah. And our, our primal nature. Um, and that was a, a defining characteristic for him. And this is what you have in, in the Eastern uh, traditions uh, for the most part is that the, the divinity lies within. We are already divine. We are inherently uh, blessed with the sense of God or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that in the Eastern traditions, the emphasis again is on awakening to that which exists within already. And this is quite different than the Western approach. And of course, in the West, we have developed materialism, which is an outward form of worship in its own right. So in a sense, it follows that same basic framework. Um, whereas in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, the, the focus was not on scientific materialism, but on a kind of science of the mind, mm -hmm. of developing techniques that would allow you to strip away the mask of human incarnation and to um, touch something deep inside, um, deep within you that is 
inherently your nature. You already are this expansive primal origin or, or, or consciousness. And we need to um, stop identifying with separate, a separate sense of self, which is of course very Western, the whole uh, notion of individuality and to completely abandon any of these attachments to the self image, to the persona, to who we are in a social context. All of this is a great distraction. All of this takes us away from the ability to be free to experience something um, much more profound, much deeper and much more enriching. There is an inherent joy, an inherent divinity that is always there waiting to be discovered. That's our true self, our true nature. Um, and again, this is in very simplified form, the contrasting elements that ultimately or perhaps initially led Jung to the East. He used to um, write uh, about Buddha as being a more complete representation of of uh, the spiritual path because the Buddha stressed this, this inner journey, mm. whereas Christianity was an, uh, uh, the focus on an outward form, mm. uh, being the, the Christ figure. Um, but ultimately, both are a, a representation of what we would call a God image. So whether it's an outward form or it's understood as, as an inner representation, they both have some value. They both are understood as archetypal representations of, of our deeper nature. And this is what I try to do in my work is combine um, the esoteric aspects of East and West, which are these um, traditions that were, did not become necessarily traditional traditional Catholicism, traditional uh, Protestantism, but rather were um, often repressed aspects um, of the church. And we have this throughout early church history and then later um, in different forms. Um, the alchemists in the Middle Ages who gave Jung such inspiration and served as a bridge from the ancient world to the modern, um, were involved in precisely this kind of, of inner transformation. It was initially expressed through a sort of chemical process, the transmutation of um, mm. solids into gold. But ultimately, he understood this, and ultimately, he came to um, identify with the work of some very profound alchemists who were focused on inner transformation on turning ordinary experience, including one's greatest challenges and greatest hardships into um, a process of spiritual development and unfolding and, and awakening. This is really the hero's journey. This is the um, alchemical transformation um, that I write about in the work that you quoted earlier um, or referenced earlier. And, um, so again, this is such a broad subject, and I, I can go. Yeah, in I'm filled. Directions. I'm filled with questions. Um, let me let me help you then. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Jung's notion of process of individuation did it occur before al his his con his his meeting of alchemy and and the East, or did it occur or get nuanced afterwards? I think it was present. Um, it's hard to say because he doesn't in his. Um, wonderful uh, biography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which we abbreviate as MDR in the psychoanalytic community. One of the greatest, I think the greatest book I've ever read. It's so rich in so many different areas. He doesn't designate any particular time as the beginning of his sense of the process of what he would later call individuation. In the most basic sense, it just means spiritual development, psychological and spiritual development. Um, but I definitely think his encounter with the secret of the golden flower, the Taoist text, alchemical text, was instrumental um, in what it suggested in the way of a kind of, of inner transformation or alchemical 
transformation psychologically and spiritually. This was um, the beginning of his exploration of uh, the Eastern traditions that would eventually lead him to Tibetan Tantra. And the connection with Tibetan, Tibetan Tantra is really the use of God images and sacred symbols as dynamic agents of inner transformation. Now, in the Tibetan tradition, you have deity worship and a number of different practices by which the practitioner or the um, novice monk um, will meditate upon these images of divinity as a way of, of going beyond the contraction of his usual egoic self and expanding into something greater. In Jung's work, most commonly um, active imagination is the vehicle. And you take a dream image and you go through the process of active imagination. And um, I don't know if you would like me to share with you my one of my own experiences, but it can have uh, yeah, let's define active imagination and let's let's do a little let's do a little uh, detail work around what it actually involves. So active imagination is is basically um, using a um, a powerful image or figure, typically derived from a dream, but also it could be something that you see in a photograph, something that is utterly resonant to you, and. Basically, the practice begins with, well, I'm, I'm, going, to sh I'm going to share my experience, and as I go, I will reveal the basic uh, formulation. Um, I had a dream once uh, while I was at Pacifica Graduate Institute studying counseling psychology with a Jungian emphasis, um, and part of what we were studying was this very element, and I had a dream in which... Um, I understood my future career as being prominent and um, I was going to be this um, uh, very influential exponent of Jung's work. And there was this sense of pride and, and um, social reputation uh, or professional reputation that was initially connected to that part of the dream. Then a curtain appears and I slide the curtain open and I walk onto a football field and there's a ball there waiting to be kicked in a goalpost. And the, if the ball goes through the goalpost, then the earlier association of the dream will come true. And if not, then perhaps not. And so I stepped up, kicked the ball, it hit the, the, the lower rail of the goalpost, football goalpost and bounced down and it was it, it, it was utterly stunning to me uh, what am I dreaming and, and why is this important and I knew that it that it, it had a special meaning there are this is what Jung called a big dream there are big mm -hmm. dreams and small dreams big dreams leave a tremendous impression on you and when you have a big dream to be able to amplify that dream and understand its deeper meaning is essential to the individuation process, to understanding who you are, what journey you are on, and how to move beyond limitations and expand into a, a greater sense of consciousness. So active imagination then, which I was learning at the time, is something that I did with myself. It's typically done with a counselor. It can be done alone. Um, what I did was, and what you do, is you become completely centered and completely quiet and you focus on the main image from the dream. And the dream was, the, the main image was clearly the goalpost. And I began with that image in mind. And the dream just then unfolded. You're, you're to allow your psyche to of its own accord, just flow into a, a dream scenario. Let the, 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 the images that follow unfold of their own accord. And I did that and I found myself back on a football field and I was the quarterback. And I would go back to, the, uh, to pass and attempt to throw the ball to a receiver who would then score the touchdown and that was the goal. And each time I did that, 
I failed. Hmm. Finally, I kept the ball and ran through the defense and landed just across the goal line. When I landed on the ground, the football turned into a glowing blue diamond. Hmm. And that blue diamond spoke to me from, from a place that I know instinctively to be my true self, but from which I am usually disconnected. Hmm. And what it said to me is the goal in life is not success in the outer world the goal in life is to awaken to your true nature in the inner world and it was communicated telepathically hmm. and it was accompanied by this blue diamond which is an archetypal symbol of purity and wisdom that also exists in the tibetan tradition hmm. so um i'm have included this experience in a few of my writings because it was so profound and so unbelievable. I never could have imagined this the contact with this, with what Jung would describe as the self. I am yes. the ego, I am the persona. And yet through the archetypal process, through following the goalpost as the main image and playing this process out, I was able to to um, connect with my, my higher self, which is essentially his theory of the transcendent function, which is to use um, these kinds of practices, such as active imagination, to merge with your, your greater self, a, a coming together of the ego and the self, uh, the self as the totality of the psyche. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, it's a true story, and I can't really give it justice telling it with words because it was um, beyond words. And again, the communication was purely telepathic, but it was more real than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And the key element here is that I was trying to pass the ball to someone else, which really means that I was looking for that achievement to occur outside of myself but by keeping the football and maneuvering through the defense and ultimately achieving uh the goal myself this is the inner journey as opposed to following an outward authority um and this is the amplification that accompanies active imagination. To amplify is to understand the deeper aspects of a particular scenario, especially in a universal context, because we see a, a repetition of these archetypes uh, and these universal scenarios across cultures and throughout the history of the species. And this is also one of Jung's great contributions is the understanding that this is a universal process that exists in all human beings mm. and is something that um, has manifested in various forms in all cultures and in all times. The world mountain, um, the tree of life, mm. these are archetypal symbols um, manifested through natural forms. Then you have inanimate objects such as the diamond, which represents um, the totality and purity and, and um, true uh, spirituality. They have power. They, they are resonant. They carry what Jung described as the numinous, the sacred. And when you're able to engage these symbols or these figures, including personified figures like Buddha and Christ, in a way that actually uh, merges the little self with the totality, our, our, our source, our origin, then you have this experience of the sacred. And this is what Jung felt was absolutely key to the process of individuation. When you can feel that within yourself, this changes you as a human being and redirects your focus toward the inner world. Yeah, that was a beautiful, beautiful uh, segment there, really. I think your use of your personal experience and the potency of those images, I mean, the sense of, you know, kicking and 
uh, coming up short and failing, I think we can all resonate with. But there's something, there's something, there's some very secret teaching there about the stick to itness of the imagery. And it's a little misleading maybe to call it active imagination because the way I understood you describing it was it's really letting the unconscious work itself through. In other words, uh, allow the image to be there, but it's not, it's not like you're creating anything. You're just staying with it as the unconscious works through the images again and again and again until it has a successful completion or resolution. Did I understand that correctly? Well, the, the, the active in active imagination is the willingness of the uh, right. individual to engage in the process. But ultimately, you give over the process to... Yes, I was going to use the word turn yeah. over. It's, it's yeah. the willingness... You're actively, willingly turning yourself over to the unconscious That's right. and letting the unconscious lead you through something rather than resisting against it or fabricating or actively constructing something in a way maybe like a daydream is a construction. The act of imagination is, is sort of turning oneself over. Like what is the, it's almost like the wisdom is latent. It's already there. That's right. Absolutely. And I think and again, Jung, Jung, the, the, Jung was Jung. I think, in contrast to Freud, correct me if I'm wrong, but their their views of the unconscious were quite different. I mean, I'm not sure who it was that thought maybe you could, you know, the, the unconscious was something deplorable and that trips us up. Whereas, I, I, if I if I remember my reading on Jung correctly, Jung thought it as a necessary ally. That the that the sort of and, I, and the image that I think I remember was that. Whereas consciousness is like the sail, the the unconscious is like the 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 rudder or the the sort of counterbalance to a ship, and that there is no there is no period where there is not there's going to be an overcoming of the unconscious. The unconscious the unconscious doesn't get illuminated in some you know apocalypse, and is and then is forevermore obliterated. It it has its function forevermore. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely, because the unconscious is the archetype of the self. It is the totality. It is our origin. We're not the main event. And this is something that Jung emphasized again and again. As incarnated um, entities, we take on a persona, an image, and we're, we're confined to a sense of separateness in the world. There's a, there's a separation between you and me as separate, different people, between me and the environment. I'm not that tree that I'm looking at. And the idea in both Buddhism and also ultimately in Jungian psychology is unus mundus, which translates as one unitary world. We are ultimately completely interconnected and all things arise in Buddhism from the universal mind or in Jungian psychology from the self, the totality, the psychic totality. In both traditions, it is mind, not matter, that is the source of everything. Matter is an expression of mind, and mind is the source, or you could say in psychological terms, the psyche is the source, the totality. And so our manifestation as human beings is, is a greatly limited form, and that's the whole idea of, of a spiritual practice is returning to origin or source, which requires us again to remove the planetary mask known as persona or separate mm. self. And through practices like active imagination to merge with the totality, the origin of who we are. And it's through that kind of numinous or sacred experience that we feel a genuine sense of, of meaning, of being connected to something much bigger than ourselves that we are already, but in our normal waking consciousness, we are typically divided from. Mm -hmm. And so this is really, you know, I think what's happening collectively also, I think for so many, for hundreds of thousands of years, we have in one form or another, um, existed as separate entities. Now, we've gone through some very fascinating periods in which there was a strong emphasis on this merging with the source through, through different forms, whether it's 
uh, you know, ancient Greece and its um, rites and rituals of rebirth or the Gnostics or um, the alchemists, all of this was occurring in the last 2,500 years, but going way back, I believe it was your last week's guest who was talking about the standing stones and um, some of these other remarkable um, uh, creations that date back uh, five to 8,000 years. And I have experienced some of this in Scotland. And what he was talking about really resonated with me. In Jungian psychology, the stone is one of the primary symbols of the self, of the totality. And it's a physical earthly manifestation which connects us to the earth because the earth is not separate. It comes from the same origin. And, and as human beings, I think the great challenge in our time is to understand that, that all sentient beings and even non-sentient beings like stones arise from the same place and return to the same place. And that we must learn to live in harmony and also learn to expand our consciousness to include what otherwise appears to us as separate. Yes. And I, I think this is a radical transformation in human consciousness. Yeah. The ability so, to actually I'm, sense, yeah. you know, the, the, the oneness that we all share as opposed to being separate entities. Yeah, that last little bit is, it seems now three, four, maybe four or five guests, they're all, all in their own ways from their own disciplines are saying the same thing. It seems very much like the direction that we're going the work of the gentleman that you were talking about, Chris Beish, uh, whether it be Freddie Silva, who was the guest that I had recently, uh, and his, um, you know, his committed life to ancient, uh, ancient histories and ancient civilizations. Uh, I also had on um, uh, a, a wisdom keeper in the Druid and alchemical traditions. Um, his name is escaping me for, for some reason, but all essentially saying the same, uh, John Michael Greer, a wonderful speaker, so 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 thorough in his assessment of the universality of esoteric traditions, all, all in a way uh, pointing to the same thing of having a personal and direct encounter, uh, a direct experience, what he called direct participation mm -hmm. with the field. And that field, if you were looking at it in concentric circles, it's like it's breaking down and ever expanding. So some of the guests now that are coming on are saying just this, that the, the end of patriarchy in a way is the end of like the shedding of the persona. But what that means is that we're now touching other dimensions. We're now in being more inclusive of other realities and the presence of sentience in the environment, for example, my last guest and recording hasn't been released yet. Um, you know, Eric Anderson, Eric Jampa Anderson, who's a Tibetan uh, medical doctor and astrologer, his forthcoming book is on the fact that it's, it's called Unseen Beings. And he's basically talking about the expansion of consciousness to be so inclusive that even plants, animals are treated as self. Yes. And, and I think, so it's just, it, it just feels to me that we, if we were to return now to the grand narrative that we set up midway through the conversation of the dark night, the collective dark night of the soul and the potential that is concomitant within it of reaching some, you know, new, new vision a new vision of ourselves individually, but also a new collective vision of who we are. Like if we start to look on the one side of the coin, we see great racism and great economic div divisiveness and polarization and, and just the mud and mire of the shadow collectively, structural, structural in inequities and you name it. But what is coming through, what is coming through from the self, if I can use Jung's word, is the possibility of experiencing a greater vista as the self. Absolutely. And that is, I believe, our destiny. I, uh, there are direct correlations to the work of Aurobindo, for example, who is, of course, the, the great Indian philosopher and mystic 
who talked about merging the dimensions, bringing um, higher consciousness to a planetary level so that it's not something that we experience on rare occasion, such as my dream example, or somebody as with Bosch who is venturing into these dimensions, um, but in a sort of controlled and, and, and only occasional format, but rather something that becomes a living part of who we are as manifestations of spirit in physical form. Um, whether or not this was intended from the outset, that this is some mission of sorts that is playing itself out over hundreds of thousands of years, ultimately, ultimately leading to a merging of uh, physical existence with the uh, divine source from which it originates, hmm. or whether this is something that has occurred um, just in the process of earthly manifestation, it's difficult to know. But there is, I think, a growing consensus among people like Gene Houston and Anna Luce Smitsman. Certainly, it's in the work of Arubindo and others. And it's revealed in Beisha's work uh, in a definitive sense, that this is part of a broader plan that was worked out on another level and that all of us are, are a part of. We choose to come here. When we choose, I mean, we're in a different dimension, in a different form, mm -hmm. and we work out our lives and our scenarios ahead of time. We come here to learn, to love, to, to um, struggle through um, these archetypal and mythic processes that are so beautifully elucidated by Jung and Campbell, for example. This is all part of a developmental process that is immense in scope and would involve in Beisha's understanding and in Tibetan Buddhism, hundreds, if not thousands of individual incarnations. Yes. And those incarnations are only a small part of a broader um, spiritual reality or entity that is actually guiding or promoting or, or, or manifesting uh, earthly incarnations um, of the sort that, that we're presently experiencing. So this is huge territory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the implications are immense. And um, again, to echo your point and the point that is uh, a central part of Beisha's work early, I'm sorry, um, Dark Night, Early Dawn, for whatever reason, our developmental process, both personally and collectively, involves struggle as part of the releasing of this sense of separateness, and that we must go through a kind of dark night, both personally and collectively, in order to expand into a greater consciousness. So what's happening in the world may well be part of something that is not only leading us to a better place, but was actually planned in advance as part of the way that things work on this dimension. And yeah. so there's an old saying, you have to go through hell to get to heaven. And this would seem to apply in this context. But the great challenge is going to be, I think, and Beish emphasizes this in his work, we're going to need to have a different understanding of tragedy and of horror. And we're going to need to, um, in some way, come to terms with it as a natural part of the process. Not that we encourage it, but that we find a way to deal with it in a more accepting and holistic manner. Yeah. So that it isn't seen as separate and as something that we push away, but rather something that we work with as part of facilitating this, this transformation. Yeah, wonderfully put, and I, 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 I'm, I'm in agreement. I feel. I mean, at least the the structure of my book takes people on a journey through Jung and Joseph Campbell precisely to empower them, so that they don't feel at odds with their predicament. That actually this is necessary, and in a way, there's no other way. There's no other way, uh, but through through the encounter with the shadow, 
through the all the resistances and all the demonic forces, all the confrontation, the revelation of our dark past. I mean, on a collective level in Canada and North America, where they dig up mass graves of children and and the underbelly of racism that is now so apparent and the the misogynistic uh, impulse and the economic polarization and all these grotesque underbelly of our collective psyche and our collective culture that we would all too well and w wish to wish them away right Exactly. Uh, and and same with trauma responses when you're working with just a simple with one individual, one client and they want they want to be done with their addiction, they want to be done with their dissociation, they want to be done with their depression. It's like in a way you have to come undone and you have to confront the madness as you did in Thailand for 2 years in order to actually find the inner resources that that are they're not they're not given, they're earned. Mhm. Mm Good point. And the strength that we want, and I think I think that my comment on our culture, especially young people, is that they they they're quite entitled, mm -hmm. and they they want comfort, and we want to deliver that comfort. I mean, we want want it in a pill, we want it in a fast acting, you know, tincture, we want it in a a, a, a you know a hack, a biohack, a quick diet, uh, an eight week course. If you look at the motivation underlying it, it's like, I want to get to heaven without going through any hell. Yeah, that's right. And our culture's gotten really fat on good at that. Uh, but I think esoteric traditions world over, they understood. I think Jung understood it and articulated it in a way that we in the West can understand it in an archetypal language. But I think shamanism, I think psychedelics. I think about... Tibetan Buddhism. I think about all these cultures. I mean, even my visitation to Bali, I mean, the energy in Bali is very palpable, but it's not all angelic energy. And the, and the demons have to be appeased. And if you're not careful, they're going to bite you in the ass. And that biting you in the ass is actually really necessary because you're not seeing something totally. There's some aspect of your psyche that hasn't fully integrated and so it's it's when it's not integrated that it hikes up the volume to give you a good kick in the ass. And that's what the world is going through right now. We have dissociated ourselves so fully from the environment and so fully from each other and crawled up into our ivory towers that now there's a nasty backlash. And, it, and we have a choice, bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not there, build an ivory tower in New Zealand to, 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 to escape the pandemic, or actually deal deal with the, the shadow reasonably. And I, I think there's, you know, we're, I, th I think that one of the things that I like in our discussion is that it leaves many roots into the same understanding. I see the movement, the psychedelic movement, capturing the imagination of a whole new set of people that are going to be able to venture into those new domains and reclaim the sense of totality that you experienced in the Amalias at 30. Mm -hmm. That what that drop in the ocean. And they're going to see the mountain as themselves and they're going to see the trees as themselves. And but they're not going to do it from an intellectual place. They're going to do it from a thoroughly engaged, visceral, intuitive place. And it's only then when it's intuitive that you see the mountains and the rivers and everybody else as yourself that you're finally fucking going to respect them because the conceptual level of understanding is not going to cut it. But there's not everybody's going to take an ayahuasca journey. And so for example, in my own practice, you can go on a shamanic journey. You can go on a pilgrimage as you did and, I did, and, I, and as I did in, at 20. And it amounts to the same thing if done well. And you can also go into psychotherapy. And you can, there have been all these avenues provide a way for the predisposition of the practitioner to meet the mystical, the mystical realm that Jung was so seeking when he confronted the East. And, and I think that's useful for everybody because in a way we're all co collectively, we're all facing the same dark night. Um, but our way of ascending to the light or of ascending to awareness, the new dawn of awareness is by various means.
there are so many ways to get there now. Mm -hmm. And that's refreshing uh, because I think everybody's inclined a little bit differently to it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can segue to ask for any of your um, parting wisdom or if there's a message that you want to broadcast, uh, you know, having now gone through your two year stint, having arrived with a wonderful course, which I'm uh, planning on taking with you, combining Jung and Tibetan Buddhism, having, you know, uh, confronted some of the elements that you had disassociated from or distanced yourself from feeling more uh, integrated yourself personally, but also with the fact that we are finding ourselves at this epic period in history where there's agreement all around about the expansion of consciousness. Is there anything further that you want to sort of conclude on, give our uh, listeners something to mull over. Maybe you don't answer it for them, but maybe you offer some further question, further practice, anything at all. Very good question. And uh, there are so many things that we could um, elaborate upon, but in basic terms, I think the knowledge that we are so much more than this earthly incarnation is an understanding that is essential. I think in some way, um, even if it's deeply buried, there is a deep intuition, what Jung called a religious instinct in human beings in which they understand at a deep intuitive level that they are in essence uh, a spiritual entity and that they derive from this remarkable, unfathomable um, psychic source that is in its essence divine. And so apparently we come to this planet as manifestations, finite manifestations of an infinite or eternal entity. Jung used to emphasize, and he came to this at a very young age, the difference between his number one and number two personalities. The number one personality was the social, egoic self, the ordinary person who lives in this world. And the number two personality was this eternal self, a self that was greatly expanded and eternal. It wasn't confined to time. The dimension from which we derive is timeless. Here, we live in time, we are finite entities, but our nature is infinite. And this is what you experience in mystical experience. You experience a union and that union is an eternal, uh, or a sense of the eternal, a sense of, of a, a unified uh, consciousness that is beyond time and is in its very nature divine. And if people can, tap into that number two personality, if they can give that some room, some space, and begin to allow it to speak to them through dreams, through uh, spontaneous engagements with the, the visuals they may come across in their everyday lives. This is a means of beginning to, to reconnect on a more conscious level with that origin, that divinity. And again, it often happens through sacred symbols and archetypal forms, which is why Jungian uh, and Buddhist psychotherapy, which we both perform, can be so helpful in that regard because people are um, given an opportunity to remove the mask and to explore these, these deeper possibilities. So, um, Keep the faith in that sense. There really is something profound and utterly beautiful to discover. And we have to be willing to go through sometimes a, a very difficult journey involving um, the unmasking of our usual sense of self in order to, to merge with that greater totality because it's not a human incarnation full stop. It's so much more than that. We are the drop within the ocean and the ocean is our true nature, not the drop. But right now as a finite entity incarnated on this planet, we appear as a, a separate drop. 
<laughs> and the reality is we're actually the ocean. And that is mystical experience in a nutshell. Um, communing in a, a unitary state with our divine origin. And it's everyone's birthright. And that would be my, my closing thought. Judson, thank you so much for your time, your contribution to the field, uh, sharing so much with you. I look forward to future conversations of synergy, maybe some travel is, you know, in play once you get back on the road. Uh, I'm going to look forward to corresponding with you through your course while I relocate to Bali, but I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your thinking over these years in the Wisdom Keeper podcast. So all my best wishes to you and thank you so much and look forward to our next opportunity to sit down and, and, and recover uh, once again all the, uh, all, the, all the great truths that are within us. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, Miles. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of Sacred Knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.